All right, and we are in it. Welcome, teachers, to another Wolang Wednesday, where me, your host, Devin, we are going to talk together about series four in our How to Start with CI, Comprehensible Input Rich Strategies series. And today, we are going to get you started on the right foot. There's been a few previous videos where we have talked a lot about, like, what exactly is comprehensible input centered instruction? What is proficiency? Why is it important? Is it here to stick around? Is it a fad or not? And today, now that we know the answers to all those questions, we are diving right in to really some, a little bit of mindset shifts on what it means to really start with this idea. If you are brand spanking new to this strategy, what it looks like to actually like get into the nitty gritty and get started with it in your classroom. And I have some ideas for you to help you get started and get past that first roadblock of just like, Bleh, what do I do? I don't even know. There's so much information and the confusion that can really surround any idea behind starting something that's really new. Or maybe you've started this before, you've tried it before, I've done this, and you're all over the place and you don't really know which direction that you tried is the best route for you to go. And you're looking for something that is, I don't know, actually practical and works for your classroom and works for your style of teaching and fits you better than maybe you trying to put on somebody else's ideas, kind of like putting on somebody else's outfit and trying to make it work for you. So that's what we're going to be doing today in our class. Let's jump right in and get into what we got going on today. Okay. So friends, if you are joining me live, I'm so excited to see y'all. Let me know one, where are you watching from? What city are you in? And then two, let me know what is something that you taught today? Like, what are you working on in your classroom? Are you a French teacher looking at maybe you're starting with some of those high frequency structures and you're looking at things like uh, je suis and il est, elle est? Like, let me know what you're working on. I would love to know. All right, let's get this bad boy rolling. Let me make sure that everything is working on here. Could you also do me a huge favor and let me know that you can see and hear everything because that is what I am checking. Looks like we're good. Eva Elise, you're in Connecticut. Hi, nice to see you. All right, cool. All right, I'm sharing my screen here and we are rolling on this train. Hi, y'all. Here we go. We're rocking and we're rolling. We're doing it. We're doing it. All right. Y vamos a presentar. Here we go. Okay. So it's worth repeating. If you've been around before, you know that I like to use this tool a lot. But if you are new around these parts, hi, I'm Devin. And I am the teacher author behind La Libre Language Learning. If you teach French or La Libre Language Learning, you might have seen a lot of my stuff is in Spanish. If you teach Spanish, I used to teach both in the high school level, and I love everything that has to do with world language teaching, and I specialize in helping teachers now full-time transition into proficiency style or more proficiency focused methods. Because one of the things I really do believe about, and one of the reasons I think it's important to talk about things like this, is that transitioning to proficiency is not easy. It's messy and it is definitely not simple. So what I would like to do with you today is help show you some ways that would kind of relieve some of the stress that you can really experience around switching to this new style. Because as much as we know that it is better from the other videos that you've seen before, and you know, not to like put shades on other methods of teaching, because I will tell you first and foremost, that I was always a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Cause you know what my number one goal was? what's going to work today, what's going to help me leave work on time, and then see like what's the most research-based method that I know how to do, that I feel comfortable working with, and that is going to work for my students in that order. So although I do believe very strongly in this whole idea of proficiency, like my number one goal is for it to be practical for you. So if you're into that, if you jive with that, then you can hang out with me more on all of these channels here. All these classes are recorded live and you can hang out with them on YouTube. I create materials for French and Spanish teachers on TPT and I have a German one coming out, hint, hint. 
And I do classes every week live forever free on Facebook. I do ideas on Pinterest, inspiration on Instagram. And then I have a blog on WordPress. I get, that doesn't matter though. You can just search for it on Google, <laughs> but I'm in all the places. So we can hang out in a lot of different ways. Oh, and I should mention this. If you have questions about today's class, hit me up right there. That's my email. All right. So before we jump into the material of today's class, let's pause for a second and set our intention and our action plan. Because as much as we all love to hang out with other world language teachers and like, it's going to be a chill world language teacher fest today for sure. But this is also very valuable time for you. So what are you going to get out of our time together? I'm checking in with the comments here. I'm a Spanish teacher and I have a lot of lower levels. So I'm teaching a lot of the basics. Yes, yes. I only ever taught levels one and two and I wanted to stay that way. There was even a point where I asked like, one of my favorite humans in the whole world is my old department head. When I used to work in a large department, I asked her, I was like, I want to stay in one and two. Basics are my favorite, but I will tell you that it is, you're right. It's not easy. It's definitely not easy um, because you do have to definitely work with materials that are at your student's level. And that is difficult. And doing comprehensible input is much you're, you get a lot more bang for your buck in the early levels. You see the progress a lot more in levels one and two. But something that you will notice as well is that you'll find yourself, if you're doing a lot of comprehensible input, rich lessons, you'll find it a lot easier. Here's just a tip for you right off the bat. If you focus in on like 20 to 25 key high frequency phrases and you just use them over and over and over and over again, like in my French one class, the last year that I was still in the classroom, I kid you not, we did the sweet 16 verbs in first, second and third person, and then sprinkled in some other vocabulary terms that would help them in their journey, you know, moving throughout talking about school and then talking about friends and then talking about descriptions of people and then talking about their own personality traits. But honestly, at the end of the day, all they really needed in order to do all of those novice level skills was I am, you are, he or she is, they want, he or she goes, they like, they don't like things like that. Like that was really the grounding force of what we did. And, you know, we did weekend chats with past tense and stuff like that. Cause I do believe it's a really good idea to do past tense in levels one and two, but that's a tangent point of the story being is that you can do a lot with only a few phrases. So now that you've had some time to think about this, I'm going to ask you again at the end of this class. And I've got, let me check my time here because we are on a time limit friends, we are going to be done exactly at 425. Okay. So hold me to it. We are going to make sure that you have something to say at the end of this class for an idea of exactly what you're going to do with this. What are you going to do this week? Maybe even if it's only one thing, even if it's only one thing, I don't know where to start. You're in the right place. You're in the right place. You're in the right place. Don't worry. We've all been there. We've all felt that way. So let's get started with some ideas for you. But what are you going to do this week if it's only one thing? Because one thing that will keep you from getting started is the idea that you need to do all of it. But actually, what's going to be a lot better for you is something that we're going to talk about in a minute, which is the 2% better rule. So I want you to keep in your head, everybody who's watching, what's something that you're going to do this week? Just one thing this week. And keep in mind the 2% better rule. I'm going to ask you again at the end of class, so be ready. All right, let's roll. So we are in the start with comprehensible input series. Now, as a reminder, like comprehensible input is not a method. It's the essential ingredient in any proficiency style class, but it's a fun term to use that everybody's really familiar with. And I did another class on that, that you can watch in the start with CI series. I'll link to the whole set here, and, but you can find all of them on Facebook or YouTube. And if you're watching the replay, maybe you've seen some other ones. Hello, future friends. Put in the comments below if you're watching on the replay live because we'd love to hang out with you. But today we're talking about proficiency and comprehensible input centered approaches. Where do I start? Where do I even start? All right. So first thing is there's a lot more coming your way after this. If you're excited to get started with some of these ideas, I have way more coming your way. This is a series of 13 classes. So we're in number four of 13. 
you're going to see a schedule posted below. I won't be able to post it right now, but after this class, I have a link for you and I'm going to put it in the comments. So you'll be able to see it at the end of class, grab the schedule below so you can see the rest. Okay, ready? Here we go. So where do I start? I don't, I don't even know. I don't even know how to do this, right? How many of you have said that before? Put that in the comments below. If you're just, somebody else just said that too. Like, I don't even know where to start. No shame in that game. We've all been there. Why do you think I made this class? Because I get asked it all the time, all the time, all the time. Here's the thing that I want you to get out of your head though. Proficiency-centered teaching is not really new and it's not really a crazy newfangled approach that requires you to have a lot of training. There are some approaches that involve comprehensible input that you would do better to have some training under your belt with. But I will tell you that I did a lot of these methods with like very little training and found a lot of success with my students because I didn't really want to go down the training route. That just like wasn't in, that wasn't in my plan. That's not part of my teaching style. But there's lots of teachers who do that. But that's your game plan after you've got like six months of this style under your belt. That's not like how you're, you know, coming out of the gate like that. You don't need to start with advanced methods. What do I mean by that? You might be seeing a lot of things that have to do with comprehensible input if you're anything like me and you were trolling a lot on the blogs trying to figure out how to get started with this that involve beautiful amazing, glorious, really community-centered approaches that ask you to really talk to your students differently, to have all kinds of meetings with them, maybe, you know, like even remove all the desks from your classroom, which is really cool, to only speak in the target language the entire class, except for times when you need to, to really up your questioning strategies, or maybe you even have dove into the world of TPRS, which is really exciting and fun. And all of those things, they, no joke, like they require some training because you do, you need some help to get that kind of stuff under your belt. It's so worth it. It's so worth it. But that's not where you should start if you're brand spanking new to this. If you're like babe in the woods, I wouldn't recommend starting there. I didn't start there. I did all kinds of different dabbling things and had a lot of success without going down those routes and going to like large three-day conferences to deep dive into these things. Here's what you can do instead if you are brand new and you're trying to figure out like, what's maybe just one thing that I can do? Try this. Switch your focus of class. Teach the same way. Teach the same things. But instead, where are your assessments geared towards? So if you're not really sure where you should start yet, if you're like looking into it and you know like, oh, this is something I really want to do. I'm convinced by all the classes that La Libre is doing and that other amazing presenters are doing on this topic. I think it's really great. But I just don't really even know where to dive in. Here's what you should do. Teach the same way with the same materials that you already have. But instead of assessing students on the explicit language features of the unit that you're going through, what if you maybe quiz them on just a speaking assignment and you did something along the lines of seeing how well they're able to understand you and how well they're able to respond back to you using some proficiency guidelines. And those are all provided by Actful. You can find a lot of free rubrics from Actful as well. And honestly, if you even just Google the, I forget exactly what uh, school or college it's from, but there's a really good Ohio proficiency rubric that you can just Google and you'll have all of the standards that you need in order to make your assessments more proficiency aligned if you're just doing speaking. What if instead of doing I'm just thinking off the top of my head, something like we were just talking about, maybe you're focusing on those really key language features of the beginning of the year, right? Like we're in mid-September right now. So maybe you're doing classroom phrases, classroom shout outs and things like that. What if you put in more rejoinders in there so that students could respond back to you instead of just understanding the commands? And then your assessment was less of a, okay, 
Make sure that you can mix and match up all of the vocabulary terms and recognize them. And it was more about, okay, now you need to interpret the sentence that includes the classroom command and then give a response to it that's appropriate. That's a more proficiency-based assessment. You don't have to change anything about your style of teaching. You're just changing around your assessment. So that's my first idea for you. And the next thing I want you to remember is that above all else, this is a very joyful, keyword joyful, community-centered teaching strategy or strategies, however you decide to go about this. So anything that you do in your classroom that puts students at the center, that's proficiency-centered. Anything that puts students at the center, at the students of the focus of your work, that works. You could do something along the lines of making a, pro I used to do this all the time, make a project of like make an Instagram of a student's favorite celebrity and have the students write out, maybe using their notes in class, make a whole project out of it. They've got to find a picture and they make a social media little poster or even make a fake account on Instagram. And it has to all be in the target language. And they're using phrases like, she has brown eyes. She is a rapper. She has three CDs or albums, I guess you could say. But all three of those phrases are things that French one students can do with simple phrases from a, a, like a vocab list or a high frequency list. Those are all things that they can do, especially if you help them and guide them through that in like week three or week four into French one. I know because I did it. And no, the grammar was not perfect or the spelling wasn't even close to perfect. But that's the switch is that instead of caring so much about the spelling and the grammar being perfect right now, you work on that later, like at the end of French one, you care more about, can I understand the sentence? Are they making meaning with these sentences? And the students are at the center of the work because they get to choose the artist. They're talking about their own interests and they're using their language to describe things that are important to them. That's the kind of stuff that we're talking about here. So no, you don't need to dive into like a whole new method in order to do this. Here's the key switch. The language feature, whatever you're focusing in on, and that could be something like grammar, something that really often gets talked about in the beginning of Spanish one and French one classes is the whole difference between masculine and feminine recognition, right? What if you just skipped it? And like, this isn't, I, I understand, this is not an option if you, work in a department and you're not quite ready to have that conversation yet, you could also just do like maybe less emphasis on it. But instead of doing the whole, you know, like putting up flashcards and saying like the O ending is masculine and the A ending is usually feminine, but not all of the time, blah, blah, blah. And doing that, what if you say, can y'all tell me if this is referring to a male or a female? when you're talking about people and then just say in passing that like, you know, sometimes you're going to see different versions of nouns in Spanish. Sometimes they end in an O, sometimes they end in an A. Every time that it ends in an O, you're going to see L. Every time it ends in A, you're going to see La. And just leave it at that and then see if they can actually use those phrases in context to make meaning. The language feature is the tool. It's not the end goal. The end goal is communication. So when you make that key switch of instead of being caught up in the minutia of are they able to recognize those simple language features, you can focus in a lot more on whether they're actually able to use that phrase in context. Okay. Those are some broad general ideas that are going to lead us to if you're like, okay, I'm with you. I'm into this. But for real, I just need a strategy. I just need something I can grab onto, one thing that I can get started with. Here's my suggestion for you. Here's one thing that I started doing when I started, when I stopped going from like, woo, 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 all over the place of like my really messy trying to switch to proficiency year to like really locking it in and locking it down. Because I didn't, the first year I spent like all day and all night at school. It was horrible. So the second year, I tried to really dial it in. And this is what I did. Let me check my time. Ooh, I got to move faster. All right, here we go. So for the proficiency intro, here's what I suggest you do. All of us, I find as teachers, we have our own ways that we really like to introduce new vocabulary and new functional chunks. Functional chunks just means 
more of like the language, like the nitty gritty focus of things, maybe more on like the grammar side or the sentence building blocks side, things like, um, like verbs, like he goes, she goes, right? Instead of, you know, dog, cat, cup. I'm just looking at things around me. Um, so for this proficiency intro, what if you instead ditch the vocab PowerPoint or whatever you usually use and try to teach the same exact words? You don't have to change the order of what you're doing, but change the same words. Maybe try with a novel instead. Are you working with a lot of high frequency verbs and maybe you're talking about dogs? What about trying Brandon Brown wants a dog? That's a really famous CI novel. It's actually very, very cheap to get on Fluency Matters. Each copy, if it's digital, I think is like $5 per student. So you can look into seeing if that is available to you. Check with your administrators. Don't pay for it yourself. Check with your admin. And if you can't get your admin to pay for it this year, that's fine. Move on to another idea. Try a comprehensible story. You can get lots of free comprehensible stories online and teach the same material, just in a little bit of a different way. Or you can maybe even try a contextualized vocab presentation. What does that look like? Maybe you're teaching a family unit. This is my favorite way to present this. So if you are teaching a family unit, instead of handing over a vocab list and giving students 30 terms of family members and maybe doing like the, you know, the PowerPoint or going through the textbook of like, you know, abuelo, abuela, bisabuelo. Bisabuela. You can do the whole thing where you actually say, Este es mi abuelo. Esta es mi abuela. And show pictures of your family tree and then ask students questions to see if they understand to be like, ¿Quién es mi abuela? ¿Dónde está mi abuela? And try and see if they can figure out like what's going on with it. And you can continue to do that and see how much they understand and then get your students to eventually do the same thing. They're not gonna wanna do it in front of the class, but they'll, they'll be happy to do it like on paper, make their own family tree or do something along those lines. The next one is number two. If you did skills instead of language features, so if you have to teach language features, or maybe, you know, it's just, it's embedded in your curriculum and you don't really know what to do about it right now. So that's fine. Just put a pin in it. You can look at it later. But for now, if you have to teach the verb ser or estar or être, instead of doing conjugations, what if you maybe just included already conjugated forms as the tools for your tasks? Ask students to describe their family members and then answer the question, what is he or she like? Because then if you give them the question, what is your grandfather like? What is your grandmother like? And you're providing them with those tools, then they can use them in context. Like instead of giving them this whole big giant chart and saying, this is how you make the, this is how, this is too like, this is he put those together. You can just be like, what is he or she like? And then ask for the answer and care more about the answer than the process of putting all those kind of like math formula pieces together. All right, I'm rushing through this last one because I want to give you some ideas for this and we're on a time crunch. But here is what I think are the easiest, like low friction, low entry point ways, pick just one of these that could be a really good routine for you. A really good way to kind of jump into comprehensible input influence strategies without like making it the whole focus of your old classroom, because I wouldn't jump into like all of it all at once is you can do this. Implement a password. Classroom password. I have a whole video on this. If you are interested, comment below. I will show you that video. Um, make sure you put it in the comments below. Special person interview. I also have a whole blog post about this and an interview video with the creator of this activity. This is a game changer, changed my life, changed my classroom. It's amazing. But the best part about it is that it's a speaking activity that's really, really community centered. And it allows students to be the star of your classroom in a non-embarrassing way. And also in a way where they're talking the whole time, but really they're kind of just, they're hearing a lot of input from you because all the input comes from you asking the questions. Song of the week. That is by far the easiest routine for any teacher to just jump right into because it doesn't require nothing. 
All you got to do is make time in your schedule, in your precious, precious schedule, like cut a lesson if you need to, that you know is not going to help your students and put in a song every week and then do something with that song that's very interpretive, very, very proficiency focused. What if you did a calendar talk or a weekend chat that was a weekly routine where every Monday you did a weekend chat? I used to do a weekend chat almost every Monday and it was a game changer. Like those French ones had past tense down in the phrases that we talked about. Calendar talk is also awesome. I've never personally done this, but I hear people rave about it. This is another really good proficiency routine. So look into that idea if you would like to. There's tons of people who have great ideas for that. And then some last ideas that I have for you is you can do task-based practice instead of feature-based practice. I'm gonna run you through like the teeniest, tiniest example of this so that we can stay on track here for time. But here's what you need to do. Task-based practice is this. Instead of teaching students how to write the date, like hoy es el 15 de septiembre, you can say, okay, everybody needs to go. I got this example from the podcast BVP. I think it's so good. And I used to use it in my classroom. Tea with BVP. The what if you gave the students a survey and said, okay, we're going to celebrate everybody's birthdays, but you need to ask everybody in Spanish and have them respond to you in Spanish when their birthday is. And you don't care the quality of the response. It just has to be in Spanish. So they can say, quince, octubre. Like as long as the student understands them, they have to write it down. And the task is they have to go around the room and get five birthdays in Spanish from other students. And you, the way you grade it is you care, are they able to get five birthdays in Spanish? And you don't care about like how accurate it is. You care about how comprehensible it is. That's task-based practice instead of feature-based practice. Feature-based practice is when you do stuff like this. Okay. Write the date in Spanish or like unscramble. S septiembre el de quince. Like that's feature-based practice. So we're going to go to task-based practice instead. And then of course, you know, the ultimate winner, CI games every Friday, look up the term CI games. I also have a blog post for you about my 10 favorite games and activities that promote speaking and do them every Friday. Games are the best way to provide input in a way that's like super sneaky and your students would never know. My favorite one was mafia. All right, y'all, you ready for this? Here's the 2% better rule. I need to get 2% better at watching my time because I'm already over. But we're going to do this really, really quickly. You ready? Here's the 2% better rule. Instead of trying to jump in to CI, whatever you want to call it, proficiency-oriented strategies, all that good stuff, your focus, instead of trying to be 40% better this week and then keep up that 40% momentum every single week. Do you already feel how exhausting that is? Try this approach instead. I'm going to be 2% better this week. And then next week, I'm going to continue to be 2% better. And then I'll be 2% better the week after that. And I'm going to continue to do that. By the end of the year, you will be 40% better and you'll be consistently 40% better. And you will also have these incredible stacked habits. 2% better adds up really, really fast, really, really fast. Because the value of building habits, it matters a lot more than huge strides. So let me tell you something about this. All of these routines, I did one of those like about every like two to three months. I started with song of the week, my first year teaching, because I loved songs and I did that for forever. And then I tried the task-based practice. Then I moved into CI games when I first started diving into CI because I love games and those are easy. You don't need to learn how to teach that way because everybody can do games. Then I learned about weekend chat and started doing weekend chat. That was like year two. Then I started doing special person interviews and passwords. I didn't really love passwords at first, so I stopped it. And I just did special person interviews like once every two weeks or so. Then guess what happened my last year in the classroom? I did all six of these every week consistently because I did the whole 2% better thing. Like that, this progression took three years. It's not, this is not going to happen overnight. 
And that's okay. It's not supposed to. You're not going to be a newbie forever. So let's get at them. What's one thing that you're going to do this week? What's an idea that really spoke to you that you're like, ooh, I like that. Or what's something that you're already doing in your classroom that you know that's proficiency oriented and you love it? Celebrate your progress. Or maybe you're just trying and you're like not really sure, but you're trying it. I'd love to see how it's going for you. All right, let me see what we got in here. Jeanette, thanks for watching. What do you got? I'm doing some CI type stuff. The biggest struggle I'm having is how to catch kids up when they've been absent for something like a special person interview. Ooh, feel that so hard. Are you ready? So I did special person interviews forever. Here's what you do. So I used to write down everything that the person said for their special person interviews. Cause Jeanette, I'm assuming that I'm, I'm looking over here cause I'm seeing your comment over there. I'm assuming that what that means is that you're also maybe making this like a huge part of your lesson plans and maybe you're assessing on them. I used to do quizzes on these special person interviews. The next day after the interview, make sure that you have what the person said written down somewhere, A, or B, typed out somewhere so that you can pull it back up and review it as part of your warm up. Here's what I used to do. I had this great classroom that had three humongous Mamma Jamma whiteboards. And so one of my whiteboards was dedicated to SPIs, special person interviews. And I would write down everything that that special person interview person was saying exactly as they were saying it. And I also wrote it in correct French instead of the person speaking, because you know, like they're gonna trip up and say things and you don't ever wanna embarrass them about it or like correct them. That's a no, no. So while they were speaking, when they say like, you know, gem regard Netflix, you say, oh, tu aimes regarder Netflix? You fix it while you're writing. So I would write it on the whiteboard while they were speaking. And then I would ask them questions and I would point at it and say, class, regardez, elle aime regarder le Netflix. Quel show? Quel programme est-ce que tu aimes regarder? Like that kind of stuff. So Writing during the whole special person interview process is amazing because I would recommend that you also make sure that students have to take notes during this as well and that you test them on it. And the next part is that, you know, you might not have a giant whiteboard that you could dedicate to this. You might be teaching virtually right now. I, I'm currently going through the hell that is virtual school because my student, <laughs> my kindergartner is on virtual learning and his teacher is a saint. But so you might be going through that right now. And if that's you, then you can save it somewhere where students can see it like Google Docs and make sure that they all have access to it and they can just like copy and paste it into their notes because, you know, who cares? That's fine. But point of the story being is that you have everything recorded for them. And then I would I would go through it like two or three or four times, like almost every day until the day of the quiz. Like we would do the interview on Monday. And then we would talk about that student every day for a week and then test on it on Friday. Like it have over and over and over and over and over again and ask a lot of questions about it. That's how, what I do. And then when they're absent for the special person interview, it honestly doesn't matter because by the end of doing it four or five times, reviewing what YouTube channel that person likes to watch mukbang on, the whole class knows everything about that person. Like, because you've you've really hammered at home. You've really, really hammered at home. I hope that helps you. That's a really good question though. I'd like to see the password video. Wanna? I got you. I got you. I'll put it in the comments. Emily, I use passwords at the door. Yes. And I did special person interviews to review at the beginning of the year. Nice. I would like to do weekend chat. I've done it before, but I always felt like it was taking away too much time from the curriculum. Ooh. Raise your hand if you feel that. We all feel that. Full stop. Full stop. Here's how you do weekend chat in like 10 seconds. Lies. 10 minutes. But here's how you do weekend chat in like 10 minutes. It's your warm up. It's your forever warm up on Monday. Class, qu'est-ce que tu as fait ce weekend? What did you do this weekend? And I would almost always use the same phrases. Um, for a while, I actually used to use the, the little scavenger hunt that mis classes locas used to have and it was a sheet where it was 12 boxes 
So you can check on her store and find it. There's one for French and Spanish, but I use that forever, like forever, instead of making my own because I didn't have time for it. Um, And I would use a lot of those phrases. But the point of the story is that you could also make it yourself if you want to. But I had 12 boxes that had the same phrases in them each weekend chat. And it was part of the Monday routine that students would pull it out. And they had to go and find somebody to sign on it because it's kind of like a human scavenger hunt to see what other students were doing. And here are the phrases that they would have on top. Je suis resté chez moi. I stayed home. J'ai regardé Netflix. I watched Netflix. And then they would have to put what TV show they were watching. Always a good conversation starter. And then the next thing was like, j'ai écouté la musique. I listened to music. Um, J'ai dormi, like all kinds of things. Like I slept, <laughs> like you can, you can put whatever you want. But point of the story being is that they use the same phrases over and over again. The first time you do it, yeah, it's going to take 30 minutes because it's going to take them time to get used to it. But if you do it more than like four or five times, it doesn't have to be an every Monday kind of deal, but you can make it really, really quick. It used to be a warm up question for me that we would do for 10 minutes. So if you want to go back into weekend chat, I highly recommend it. Just use the same 12 phrases over and over again and find different ways for students to interact with each other. Like, for example, you could put sticky notes all around the classroom that are each phrase and they have to go and sign underneath the three things that they did. That's a, that's a quick 10 minute warm up. That's how I used to do it. Yeah, those are great ideas, though, y'all. Thank you so much for sharing. Delian, I hope that's helpful to you, Emily. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing all your ideas. Let's go back and look at some of these since you're talking about it. So with all of these routines, again, I will say that the first time that you do these, they are going to take time. Like the first weekend chat I did took like half of my block period. Um, Yeah, it was like 40 minutes teaching everybody what the phrases were. And we only did six phrases. You know, we did the simple ones because it was French one. It took like 40 minutes. It absolutely did. But then it, as it became part of the routines, like right now you're probably feeling the pressure because everything takes so long in the first six weeks of school. Everything takes forever because you're teaching them all of these beginner phrases. Everything's new to them. And not only that, they're just getting used to the idea that they have no idea what the hell's going on, that you're speaking this different language all the time. And they're just a little shell shocked right now. So it's, it takes a lot longer to do these routines. I would not base the length of time that these routines are taking you right now for how long it's going to take you in November or December. Because think about the routines that you did last year. I bet you it took a long time for some of those to really sink in. They're probably like second nature now. And that's the same thing that will happen with a lot of these ideas. Like anything that has to do with that switch, the same thing will happen for you. (laughs) Oof. <laughs> we went super over my bad, but you guys had so many good questions that I had to get to them. If you have more questions, I want to make sure that we cut off here, but if you have any more questions, then please do not hesitate to reach out to me. You can find me at all places at La Libre Language Learning. And I have a free gift for you. If you would like to dive further into all of these materials, you can go to, I already lost it, but whatever. I'll put it in the comments. If you go to lalibrelanguagelearning.com forward slash toolkit, you can get a full 20 plus page ebook on all things world language teaching, but it especially talks about how to transition to proficiency in a way that won't take you a lot of really confusing, difficult steps. It's set up like if you liked the way that this class was set up, where it was like, find something that works for you, that's practical, and that will get you where you want to go, slow baby steps. That's the way the ebook is set up. So again, you can find it at lalibrelanguagelearning.com forward slash toolkit. And I'll put it in the comments below as well as all the other things that y'all are asking for. Oh, and Eva Lisa, I see you too. A story, you're doing stories. That's really exciting. I would say that's like probably the number one thing that made the biggest difference in my classroom was starting to use stories. And I'll tell you why, because I got really tired of constantly being the source of input especially because since I teach both French and Spanish, like my language skills are not as high as I would like them to be. So it is a lot of work for me to really like be talking all friggin' class, all friggin' class. So 
using novels and using stories uh, was such a game changer for me, such a game changer. So I'm really excited that you're doing that. That's really cool to hear. I'm so excited to hear about all the things that you're doing in your classroom. Y'all, thank you so much for joining me for this class. I can't wait to see you for the next one. You can see me the same time, same place. Come hang out with me again, Wednesday at 4 p.m. Or you can catch it on the replay. It's forever free. Hang out. It's a good time. All right, y'all. Have a great rest of your evening. And I'm so glad that you got centered with one idea that you want to start. And thanks for sharing some of your evening with me. Catch you on the flip side. Adios. Que les vaya bien.